Thank you, Ref Mum, for those announcements from the Community Bulletin Board. Before that, we heard the Jordan Journal with Howard Jordan uh, heard Fridays at 3 p.m. here on WBAI New York 99.5 FM and WBAI.org on the web. It is now 5 p.m. Stay tuned for State of the Arts NYC with Savannah Bailey McLean. Coming up. Good evening. This is State of the Arts NYC, where we cover art. And tonight, our theme is Modern Art Pursues the Truth Relentlessly. On State of the Arts tonight, we will examine the exploding contemporary art scene. And with that said, during this fall season, there are a number of of international exhibitions, performances, and talks on how history, culture, and everyday life has impacted modern works. Joining us is Liza Amadi, Director of Asia Contemporary Art Week, and we have Jason Jacques, who is the owner of the Jason Jacques Gallery on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. Leza was born in Afghanistan, where she lived until her family relocated to New York when she was a teen. She is an independent art curator, educator, and noted specialist in art from Central Asia. As the director of the Asia Contemporary Art Week at Asia Society, Amadi brings together leading New York City museums, galleries to participate in special exhibitions, receptions, lectures, and performances citywide. Now, we will talk with Liza. Uh, Liza, are you on the line? Yes. Um, thank you, Sonova. Um, actually, the, na- the spelling, um, the pronunciation of my name is Liza. Uh, Liza Ahmadi. I am on. very excited to be speaking with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. So you were, um, well, I should step back and say that um, Asia Contemporary Art Week was launched in 2002, and you became the director in 2005, correct? That's right. And um, mm-hmm, Go ahead. Yes. Um, by the time I came bo- on board, um, it was... Uh, Still quite a um, small initiative uh, with mostly Asia-specific, um, concentrating on Asia content only, um, number of museums and galleries, um, and the initiative was actually started with um, independent curators, but mm-hmm. also collectors and gallery owners who felt like there was a real special need for um, critical attention and a collective um, focus on seeing what was going on at that time um, in New York, which was, um, you know, even though such an international city um, with such international um, art scene still um, had at the time tendency to um, be quite Eurocentric. And um, this idea of banding together um, and uh, learning about each other's programs and, and also um uh, creating a campaign that um, connects uh, all the different voices because Asia is such a um, enormous place. Um, yes, and, and that's that what time, I, I that's what I wanted to break in to say. I think that one of the interesting things that have happened over the last few years is that people are starting to learn about Asia and that it is a huge, huge continent. And there are different areas of that continent. Uh, you have in Southeast Asia alone so many uh, countries that's below India and, and smaller islands um, in, the, um, in that Indian Ocean, in addition to Central Asia, which a lot of people do not know very much about. And so I understand that your specialty was to widen that understanding of um, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, but also the Middle East, correct? 
Yes, um, absolutely. When, uh, you know, back in 2001, 2002, mm-hmm. even as, as early as, as late as 2010, believe it or not, um, most people when they, when they thought about, or I think many still think about Asia, they think about Japan, Korea, China, very mm-hmm. East Asia, mm-hmm. especially in the United States. There's been such a focus academically, institutionally, the way that the collections have been um, you know, focused uh, by, let's say, the Rockefeller Brothers right. and, you know, and the, all kinds of foundations. And um, so the, the work really was to pave the way of, of really, um, you know, making a, a, a massive dent and in, in trying to represent, um, what, when we talk about Asia, the entire continent, which is, uh, indeed, it includes um, also um, the Central Asia, which because of its Soviet connection and history for 70 years, uh, it kind of really was very disconnected to, uh, uh. to the rest of Asia. And um, and then the Middle East as well, uh, countries like Lebanon and um, Palestine and Israel and these countries, you know, Iran, Afghanistan, they don't, they're not just, you know, hanging up somewhere in the air. They're, they actually belong in a continent. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think because of the media and, and you know, political um framing there's a tendency not to um actually situate it within asia because it's just uh i think it's also just an overload of information um obviously we, i wouldn't know uh, you know every country or every region of africa so it does require a special effort um from um professionals like us when we are talking about um art and if we're talking about places um, that we we really try to be uh, as specific and yet as broad as possible. So my work was not to just engage the um, the communities that were or the galleries and the museums that were already showing or focusing on um, art, uh, artists from Asia, but um, those who weren't. Um, for example, um, the Guggenheim and the MoMA and um, uh, the new museum, uh, the larger, broader institutions, uh, the Metropolitan de- Museum, some of them have had wonderful modern art collections from uh, some of these regions. But, you know, when it came to contemporary, um, uh, they're, they've just began. And uh, some of them have in, uh, really uh, very vibrant initiatives, particularly the Guggenheim in the past um, five years, have launched um, some of the most breakthrough um, exhibitions, really chronicling uh, what's been going on in um, different parts of Asia, particularly China. Uh, and but let me just break East. in just a little bit because um, let's let's just take a moment to talk about everything that you just mentioned. I, I personally <laughs> no <laughs> seriously because so I I personally feel that one of the uh, biggest um, problems with people understanding um, Asian art is the fact that they don't really know the continent of Asia. And you're right. There is a lot to Asia. I myself, um, several months ago, did not realize that Afghanistan was a part of Asia. And uh, we've had several guests on our show who have specialized in Southeast Asian art, but also dance and culture. And I've been learning over the last couple of years a lot about Southeast Asian art that has really um, blown me away. So you're right. People need a little bit of geography to understand um uh, the countries, but also the, the broad history like the Silk Road and how all these cultures started to intersect with each other and people and it was kind of amazing. So you're absolutely right. Um, you're also. And it's continuing. Yes. You know, and it, that's what's so uh, wonderful about what's happening right now when you said the explosion of contemporary art. What, you know, sometimes the word contemporary art is, uh, it's so daunting. It's, mm-hmm. What is it? You know, mm-hmm. but it actually is. Uh, it, it, it is a uh, a whole new uh, interpretation uh, or uh, moving forward ideas and journeys of uh, creative endeavors that were taken on by you know um, uh, so many people and cultures and heritages in in different parts of the world and in Asia. Particularly, what's so exciting about the contemporary um, art uh, that's taking place now is that the artists are um, working with uh, 
the the content is new. The issues that they're exploring are new. They're okay. they're dealing with politics. They're dealing with environment. They're dealing with immigration. They're dealing with mass uh, economic uh, inequality, gender uh, issues. Uh, you know, spiritual uh, and and all kinds of political censorships uh, everywhere. But yet they're doing it um, through the the actual. Uh, sort of mastery of understanding the, the artistic, um, histories and practices that were, um, you know, actually, uh, have been going on for a long, long time. Um, and it's sort of the renewal of uh, various different, um, historical practices from miniature painting to, um, you know, theater to, uh, street theater. To fashion. And, Painting, fashion, uh, yeah, um, but, but also, uh, you know, just history and poetry and literature, mm-hmm. um, all of it, philosophy. Um, and it's so exciting to uh, work with uh, the, the artists who are really um, uh, not just uh, taking, you know, it's, it's not just about art, really. It's, it's about the integration of art uh, with life and the reality of, uh, of life and, and in a way um, representing um so many of, of the issues that um, that are not being archived, not being looked at, or sometimes they are you know, within politics, within the media. Yet the nuances of all these, um, uh, you know, events, historical events, you know, a historical event can be something that happened just, you know, a few years ago. All right, so um, let's talk about some of those things. Like I, I do appreciate the fact that you said that um, you felt like your your efforts are moving the culture forward and i really do believe in that um i think it's important to move traditions histories forward so therefore people can value the breadth of a particular um culture because if you understand both the past its traditions with the issues of today then it will allow you to to pay attention to those nuances that you mentioned. So, for example, you have a lot of stuff going on. You have um, pop-up sort of installations that are going on. Can you briefly tell us about those pop-up installations that you're going to be doing? Sure. So uh, for everyone who uh, may not know um, of um, Asia Contemporary Art Week, it is a very large uh, initiative. It's a curatorial and educational platform. Mm-hmm. And what the work is to bring in um, any, every year about 30 to 40 museums and galleries join together as a consortium effort. And um, so the, uh, the, there are two layers to the programming, and the next Asia Contemporary Art Week, which will be the 12th edition, mm-hmm. actually, is um, it extends over three weeks, and it's coming up from October 5th to okay. the 26th. So uh, it will the the one layer or the, the tier of programming is these 30 museums and galleries, which include uh, some of the institutions I mentioned, but mm-hmm. also. Some great galleries like Icon Gallery, C24, Chambers Fine Art, um, Christie's, Dog mm-hmm. Modern, um, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, also Asia-based, um, galleries and institutions that have come on board, Beijing Contemporary Art Foundation. Mm-hmm. We are collaborating with, um, uh, Exhibit 320, uh, in, in New Delhi, Al Sakal Avenue in Dubai. Um, so it's, it's, quite a, a number of uh, institutions that are joining this initiative and um, mo- most of them are contributing actual exhibitions and programs very specially uh, organized for the week um, and uh, so you should definitely have your audiences check it out we have a full schedule and in the middle of uh, in the center of uh, all this we stage um, programs that uh, may not necessarily be uh, programs that the institutions or the galleries um, are able to stage uh, for various different reasons, either because they don't actually have the space or the funding okay. or they haven't uh, caught up to that, uh, you know, if institutional institutions, most of them, by the time they actually get to a content that they can present, it's already really have gone through many stages of a presentation, both in the home countries of the artists and elsewhere. And so by the time it's been introduced in the United States, it's, you know, quite 
those artists are quite, um, they've traveled. Uh, okay. Distance. But what, our interest what? is to represent the, the voices that are just operating right now and some of those who may not be recognized yet or they just uh, ha- uh, have been, you know, may not show up here all the time because there's just the, the ratio of activity is so um, great. So that's why I wanted you to programs. talk. Uh, I wanted you to talk about what's happening, like for instance, at the Guggenheim, the Art in China exhibition that they're about to present with a lot of provocative artists, including a number of women artists from China, which is a very um, new phenomenon. Um, yes, I would, I would love, uh, you know, as I said, the Guggenheim has um, initiated some uh, incredible exhibitions and this one is quite um, ambitious, uh, mm-hmm. covering, um, uh, you know, over three decades of, of contemporary content um, and, and that, that deals with every sector of the Chinese society. Some of the biggest artists um, in, in that um, country uh, and, and some younger generations are in, in this show, so it's very exciting. But going back to uh, the content that may not get, let's say, uh, chosen by or they or or um, sometimes that they're transitory in these bigger institutions that we, as part of ACW platform, present. As you mentioned, um, we we have this year two signature programs. Mm-hmm. One is. Um, uh, a series of pop-up exhibitions we call Thinking Projects. Right. Um, they are focusing on artists who have, um, who really dedicate their, um, as a, a lot of time, sometimes years of time to one project, um, an endeavor of research and excavation that takes place, um, and, um, as, uh, some of them are quite, uh, focused on uh, actual aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, inquiries and many of them are, as I said, they, they deal with uh, society and social issues or as a combination. And so we're giving about um, nine artists um, from different countries, from China, Indonesia, Turkey, and um, and, and a number of other um, countries um, the opportunity to uh, be here. Our consortium partners in Asia have nominated them and are supporting. So the why don't you give here. us a couple of the names of some of those artists so we can start to get to know them? Uh, sure. We will have, um, actually, I invite everyone to come to attend our Chelsea night. Mm-hmm. Um, it's on October 12th. Mm-hmm. We have uh, six galleries. Um, about four, four of them are actually opening new exhibitions and those three are, uh, the host, they're hosting the pop-up exhibitions, the thinking projects. Um, so we have three artists, Nadia uh, Bamhaj from mm-hmm. Jogjakarta, um, okay. Indonesia, Irfan Unurmen from Istanbul and Sumakshi Singh, uh, New Delhi. And they will, um, have their, um, wonderful projects that they're creating, um, installed at C24 Gallery in Chelsea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have, um, at Sundrum Tagore, a major exhibition of Southeast Asia, view of, as you mentioned, um, mm-hmm. opening, but they are also hosting, um, a Chinese, uh, sculptor, U- Ufan, okay. uh, as part of the thinking projects. We have, um, uh, a, a, a wonderful uh, woman, Yang Xin, uh, artist from um, China, mm-hmm. uh, as Klein Sun, our consortium partner, they're hosting her show. And then uh, something really exciting that mm-hmm. I'm um, I'm absolutely thrilled to invite everyone to um, on uh, October 15th, Sunday night, is for um, a very renowned Chinese artist, Don Dong, mm-hmm. who's had exhibitions at MoMA and, and, and at places around the world. He is going to um, unveil a project that he's been doing in multiple cities. It's called um, Eating the City. Yes. And uh, basically yes. it's an a, a edible installation of an mm-hmm. entire a landscape city. And uh, a, it's entirely made of thousands of cookies, biscuits, and sweets. And he invites uh, the public to come and feast on it. I um, think that is so <laughs> interesting. No, because that's one of the... Events. Um, State of the Arts is going to be attending a minimum Great. of five events. And that was one of the events I definitely wanted to attend. I think that's going to also be at SVA too, correct? Well, the, 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 the program at SVA is the field meeting. It's mm-hmm. a two day art forum, which is actually very unconventional. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very theatrical, okay. uh, uh, back to back, uh, 
presentation of performances and lecture performances, really uh, provocative discussions by about 30 um, major curators and artists from all different parts of Asia. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, been, it, this is the fifth edition mm-hmm, of that, and mm-hmm. it's actually um, attended um, very well. It's a gear towards arts professionals, but we are very happy to um, open uh, seats for the public. Um, but it's, the idea is to create the studio visit on a communal scale where we have access directly to the voices of the artists. Why are they doing what they're doing? What is the significance of what they're doing? And what do they need to move it to the next stage? Okay. Um, a lot of times artists, uh, you know, they have the opportunity to exhibit or sometimes they're, they're, they have studio spaces. But uh, sometimes the, what they really need is to actually be um, heard and, and have their insights um, shared energetically, um, mm-hmm. especially within the professional. It's a very, um, you know, it's a, it's a program that's very close to my heart. Um, I curate it and um, spend hours and hours really uh, Skyping with um, so many people, uh, these incredible creative individuals around the world. And um, the fact that they come to New York uh, from far places and we are dealing with visa issues, as you know, yes. what's going on with the, if we, uh, this year, we've really been affected by that. We mm-hmm. have um, three artists, one from Kazakhstan, one from Kyrgyzstan, um, another uh, from Indonesia. We, we're, uh, you know, just uh, really... Uh, chewing on our fingers, hoping that they'll get their visas uh, approved in time. And I um, just wanted to say that, yes, um, we've had other guests on the show um, where people were coming from um, the Middle East and they were dealing with visa issues, too, and they got um, help from Lincoln Center to do their um, production. Really? Yeah, And but what I'm trying to say is that it's a shame that we're going through these uh, troubles because there's so much that we all can learn from each other. I, I'm, I really do feel that there's been a miseducation of so many levels for uh, Americans when it comes to, you know, the world on a, a larger scale. We don't know all about Asia. We do not know about Africa. We do not know about the Middle East, and there are so many rich uh, histories and uh, artistic practices that we all can, you know, appreciate, value, and learn from. So you're not the first group that's been going. But, yes, we, we sympathize with you, and if there's anything we can do, we would like to help. But we need to wrap up this uh, segment, and we're going to, just to let our audience know, follow up with uh, ACAW, with more interviews, and um, put them on our, our podcast uh, platform. So we will let you all know when those I- additional interviews will be available. But I just want to thank you, Laza, uh, for joining us this evening and spending a little time with us. Uh, we do appreciate it, and we will be joining you when um, Asia Contemporary Art Week kicks off. Savannah, thank you so much. I really appreciate this um, opportunity. And uh, once again, I hope everyone is able to attend um, the, you know, dozens and dozens of programs we have organized at acw.info. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And we are back with State of the Arts NYC, where we cover art. And we just had a wonderful conversation with Leza Amadi, who is the director of the Asia Contemporary Art Week that will launch in New York City this year, um, the first week in October, October 5th, going through October 26th. They have a packed agenda. Uh, various exhibitions, pop-up installations, talks, performances. So we really advise our audience to check out their website to learn more. We have posted today 
two um, informational uh, uh, posts on um, the Guggenheim exhibition, Art and China, 1989, uh, the theater of, of art. That's what the Guggenheim is doing. We also was letting people know about uh, another exhibition that is going on about Asian um, art at the China Institute. Now, they deal with more traditional works, but it is a stunning, stunning exhibition with a burial suit made out of 4,000-plus jade pieces. And so that's another great exhibition that deals with Southeast Asian and mainland China uh, art. So now we come to our next guest, and we're very excited to have Jason Jock, who is the proprietor of Jason Jock Gallery, on with us. How are you, Jason? How are you? I'm great. I didn't catch your name, though. Savannah, Jason. Oh, hi, Savannah. How are you? I'm fine. So Jason um, has a gallery on the Upper East Side, and he is going to be presenting this Fall and into next year, a quartet of exhibitions. I like the way that was described. A quartet of exhibitions focusing on contemporary artists, and most of this is in ceramics. And so I found this quite right. interesting. So you have one that has already started, Second Nature, with Aneta yep. Regal, is that how you pronounce the name? Aneta Regal, yeah. Aneta Regal. Then you have another one coming up very soon, Kim Simonson, the shaman Kim party. Kim Simonson, yes. Simonson. Then you have Beth Kavanagh with the other. That will be in November. And right. and that is also being inspired by All That Glitters, the work of William Erklich and Clement Massier. Massier. So this is really quite interesting how you are doing this quartet of exhibitions that deal with very um, provocative sort of, because I saw some of the images, provocative um, ceramics, uh, particular Aneta. You have this hybrid form of animals and organic um, inspirations. I love the, the head that she did. It looked like of a wolf. A red wolf and uh, uh okay, you're mixing things up a little bit. But okay. wolf is an, is is Beth Kavner, who's an American sculptor. Okay. And uh and then the show that we have right now is a Polish sculptor who lives mm-hmm. in London. Okay. And her name is Aneta Regal and she works in a really interesting um, mixture of materials where she's using stoneware, high mm-hmm. fired High temperature fired stoneware glazes, but also using uh, stones, rocks. Okay. Quartz and feldspar, and uh, and and she's she's melting the rocks at such a high temperature that they're becoming volcanic. Wow. Melting in, infusing with the clay and creating these insanely beautiful surfaces. Wow, that's quite dramatic, and um. And the fact that she's Polish and she's living now in the UK, that's also very interesting too. So this, uh, I guess it gives well, her... She, she studied in traditional sculpting and carving, originally doing stone sculpting mm-hmm. uh, and wood sculpting, but doing, you know, classical uh, figural sculpting. And then she became fascinated with the alchemy of fire and ceramic materials where you have this loss of Role, this randomness in the process mm-hmm. where you, you, you make it and you apply the glazes, but then in the kiln, you really don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's you true. You're really addicted to that, to that sense of loss, that loss of control where, you know, with stone, you're chipping away at it. You know exactly what's going to happen next. And she loves that, um, that element of, of loss of control. Okay. All right. Well, that's I really see it in her work. Okay. So um, now I understand better Etnia uh, and her work. I got her confused with Beth. Let's talk a little bit about Beth. So Beth, 
also deals with um, stoneware and sculptures of various animals. And she's also into art and science and female sexuality, I guess the primal elements of, of humans. So that seems to be quite interesting and very different. And, well, what's exciting about Beth is that she has some, well, she's, according to the uh, ceramic artists that I know in the U.S., the sculptors mm-hmm. in clay, they all think she's the best in the world. At what wow. She does. And That's her quite a compliment. her gestures are so sublime. They look like, the way she treats clay, it looks like she's painting with a brush. Mm-hmm. It looks like she's painting three-dimensionally. Um it almost appears as if she had made it on a computer, mm-hmm. but it, it, it's so perfect. Um, but what she captures that is so incredible is she captures human emotion within her animal figures in a way that um, is just, well, for many people, it's a little bit hard to see because it's so real. It's so, uh, there's so much emotion in them. Um, that 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 it's that people find it to be a little bit difficult. Some of them. Well, what I liked about it was that it does have um, a bit of magic to it. If you look at some of the old pagan religions and and practices, oh, yeah. you get to you, you know there were you know stories about them, myths about people who were able to transform themselves or connect with the animal world and. Her ceramics, and that was interesting for me because it's ceramic, that she was able to uh, bring these animals to life with this different material and sort of force you in so many ways to uh, to deal with what she's presenting to you. I thought that was very different. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that in, in, in 17th century Salem she would have been burned at the stake. Um <laughs> Beth is, uh, is, is definitely a magical creature and, um, and, and pagan ritual and all of that, that really says a lot about the way she, um, she captures the human spirit and puts it into a, into a sculpture. Well, it just means, you know, I, it's interesting for me because if you even look at it from a biblical you know, point of view, uh, man was supposed to, you know, be the stewards of all the um, creatures on the planet and understand yeah, them and, 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 and take care of them. Didn't God form man out of clay? Yes. Yes. There you have it. So, there you have it. Yeah. The, the, the first sculpture. Yes. That's a very, very good point. That's an extremely good point. So, yes, there's this magical element, you know, like the breath of life. All of that is very, very magical. So then let's deal with your other artist. Now, Kim Simonson. Kim is a man, by the way. Okay. Sorry Kim, about that. Kim is a, is a, is a Finnish artist. Mm-hmm. And in Finland, Kim is a man's name. Okay. And uh, his last name is Simon, Simonson. And he, Simonson. he works in Fisker which is where they make the scissors, those famous uh, ergonomic scissors. Okay. With the, with the orange handles that everybody loves and knows. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a Finnish creation. And, you know, they're very famous for design. But Kim actually studied in Canada oh. uh, sculpting, and he trained in a very Beaux-Arts 19th century Rodin-esque uh, manner. Hmm. But he uses very modern ideas in his visual um, repertoire, which is, which is like, his, you know, there's, there's horror movies and Japanese anime. And mm-hmm. He's uh, most recently come up with a series called The Moss People, ah. which could almost become a uh, Hollywood movie because they're so imaginative. But what he did was, what, unlike any of the other artists that I know, is, well, first of all, like the other artists, he captures this, you know, incredible esprit, the spirit. But his childlike figures are covered in uh, flocked nylon, which is, the flocking is an electrostatic process that they developed in the 19th century, Mm -hmm. where you apply fibers to the surface of something. Originally, they used it to make velvet wallpaper. Okay. And so they would use static electricity to to magnetize, to polarize the the fibers that they would would suck on to the surface. They use a negative charge and a positive charge and and they, they pull on. So the, the surfaces look like look furry, like uh, like velvet. So mm-hmm. there's a three-dimensional stoneware but covered in velvet. 
and they're just they're magical. They look like uh, like forest creatures, like the the forest creatures, or um, some of the. And they're very, um, I don't know, almost dystopian, almost you know, uh, um, post apocalyptic a little bit. Wow. Like, it's called shaman party, and the idea is that they're like they're like these kids that have they adorn themselves with feathers and they create backpacks out of broken boom boxes and and march around in the woods and they're all covered in moss. They're very very. Uh, loved. Well, he's probably the most popular artist I've ever had. He's just, everybody is the most Instagrammable. Mm. When we do big fairs like Design Miami down at Art Basel. We uh, mm-hmm. Miami every year. They we get you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people Instagramming his work every single day. Well, it's it's a little tactile, and and people like to touch things, and so I guess that mossy surface, uh, grad, you know, uh, eventually will make people come towards it, want to touch it, want to engage in it, uh, very, very much. So, um, I look forward to seeing, uh, his. Are you coming to the show? I am going to come to all of your shows. I, I, I look that's forward great. to, um, seeing his works. Now, did I forget anyone? So that's, um, Anetta, Kim, well, and yeah, then. Yeah, so we have, we have. We have Annetta now, and then Kim is in October. Mm-hmm. He's opening in two weeks. And then in November is Beth. And then you're doing in, something in, between, in December. we've got Design Miami, which is going to be a general presentation of all our contemporary artists. But then finally, because the gallery started as an antique gallery. Ah. Um, so we started in selling. The, the great moment in Western ceramic tradition happened in France. Mm. 1890s, and so you have this, you know, the influence of Asian culture on right. ceramic uh, art, and for the first time in Western culture, ceramics were looked upon as artworks, mm. and one of the first artists in Western culture making clay was named Clement Massier, and he invented the iridescent glaze uh, back in the 1890s by rediscovering formulas of the lost Hispano-Mores glaze, which was lost in the 12th century. Wow. It was a, a Spanish Moorish uh, luster glaze ceramic. And then they figured out how to do that, and they took it much farther, because obviously chemistry in the 19th century was a lot more proficient than it was in the 12th century. And Correct. they figured out how to make iridescence. And his first show was uh, with Tiffany Glass, so ah. with Comfort Tiffany and Clement Mafia were shown together in the first Art Nouveau gallery, which is called the Gallery L'Art Nouveau. So the style that we know, uh, as the Tiffany style we know as Art Nouveau, was actually the name of a gallery in Paris owned by Siegfried Bing. And the first show of Massier at his gallery was in 1895, and uh, and, and he's incredible. Um, it, it's, uh, we have the largest collection in the world uh, of privately of his his ceramic wares from that time, which you could call Art Nouveau or Symbolist, but they're incredibly opulent. And then what we're doing is we're pairing them with the jewelry of a contemporary New York jewelry artist named William Ehrlich, ah. who is an architect by trade, and uh, as a hobby, about 10 years ago, started designing in AutoCAD um, this incredible jewelry that he has made by you know, master jewelers in New York. Um, Bill, William Ehrlich, the, the, the jeweler, happens to be a, a very important New York contemporary art collector and a big Clement Massier collector. Ah, so that's Actually, the connection. My, the connection. He was my very first client when I was selling out of the flea market in Paris in the, <laughs> in the early 1990s. And so we've been friends for 30 years. And um, and he only shows in art galleries. He doesn't show his jewelry at like Bergdorf or mm-hmm. you know, he could, but um, so he shows at Louis the Guinness in London and with us in New York. And it's it's very very exclusive and it's really really wonderful. We thought, well, you know, for the Christmas season, let's do something really glittery and and wonderful and people, you know. Well, that's like you know, uh, you know, around the holidays, people do look for a little bling, and so therefore you a added, little bling, right? Yes, you added a little bling to the holiday season. <laughs> you go. Yes. Well, that's great. Now, tell us before we end our segment with you. Now, I understand that you founded your gallery in 1991, but it sounds like it goes a little further back in France. Is that correct? Well, my my first show was. 
1989, and mm-hmm. that was the L.A., or 1990, it was the L.A. Modernism Show. Okay. Um, and that was the first art fair that I did. Um, I was I know, 20 years old. I was 21. Anyway, the, um, yeah, I guess that was, let's see, 1990, 22. I was, I was born in 68. So anyway, I was 22 years old. And then I left directly after that and started picking for American dealers. And I started my business in the flea markets in Europe finding uh, Art Nouveau ceramics because this area in Western ceramic tradition is arguably the most important and innovative moment, but it was overshadowed by the glass collecting of that period. Ah. So the glass was super popular, and ceramics were, you know, kind of nerdy museum stuff, and uh, but super cool, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit too weird uh, for most people. Okay. Uh, you know, I think I thought that glass was easier for people. It's mm. really shiny, and it's, it's easy to like it, right? Because people right. like shiny stuff. It's really, it's in our nature. It's easy to love water or diamonds or glass. Okay. But, um, ceramics are a much more sort of, I don't know, contemplative material. And um, But then you know, also it had this functional history that might make it difficult for people to see as art sometimes. Well, yeah, and, and, you know, in Eastern culture... You know, they don't make a separation mm. between craft and art. To them, it's all painting is craft, too. Calligraphy is craft, but it's their highest art form. Mm-hmm. And in, in Asian culture, the most expensive art object ever sold is a ceramic vase. Yeah. So, um, and they pulled, so the, they don't have that same sort of, you know, they don't look at, at, at ceramics as a lesser art form. Mm-hmm. But obviously, in Western culture, we kind of see toilets, I think. I think that, you know, people think of porcelain and, and dinnerware and right. china cups. And, and they don't they see it as a utilitarian um, material. And they haven't really, they didn't grasp until the 1890s that ceramics were, until they until Japan opened its doors to uh, Western trade, and they start, it became a very popular collectible that Western uh, artists started looking to clay as a place to express their, themselves. But then and I want to so- interject a little bit. You know what also, I think it really is cultural. When you think of, because I know one of your specialties is uh, uh, Japanese uh, ceramics, but um, it's just that their culture is very seamless. It flows. It has the f- a flow to it. Where mm-hmm. in Western culture, it, it doesn't have that same sort of flow. Because as you were talking about it, it just made me think that in Western Europe, they didn't have that kind of uh, sensibility. Maybe because the landscape was different and the way people were uh, trying to carve out their lifestyle. It was kind of more regimental. You know, you had serfs, you had uh, you had the various lords. It was this kind of separation of different things. So therefore, it was maybe harder for Westerners to see uh, ceramics as being a part of everyday life. What do you think? Well, I think that, I think that, you know, in, in Eastern culture, they had that too, but they didn't, it wasn't dishonorable to be, to throw tea bowls. Mm. You, know, you could be, you could elevate yourself within the society there from the lowliest tea bowl maker to a national treasure. Okay. You could be honored for your abilities, even if you weren't born into it. Okay. There, there's kind of the difference is that um, it was only really in painting that an artist was able to elevate himself, you know, further. And so, and that mostly came from the Renaissance, where you know the church was um, hiring these painters to decorate the the churches. Right. But the, you know, th- there is this this idea that this, this you this this very Zen idea mm-hmm, of going and mm-hmm. looking at forty thousand tea bowls and picking the perfect one mm. really wasn't what wasn't in it wasn't a Western idea at all. Right, and, uh, right. But the the Art Nouveau period was the first time that they made vessels, but not as uh, utilitarian objects, but as artworks that were meant to, you know, be used in the home to decorate your home, and they were never meant to have flowers in them. Okay. Okay. They were standalone objects, and anyway, the point is that the they, it was kind of not very interesting for people, and they were very inexpensive, but they were in all the museums. So we brought that back um, to the forefront of people's 
minds. And we built huge collections for private collectors and, and, and built the collections for the U.S. institutions to the big museums here. And that's really where we got our start. And then in 2010, I started the contemporary program to sort of continue that idea of, of, of Western ceramic tradition in the modern world. Well, this was great. I've learned a lot from you. I, I, I like ceramics very much. I've, I, I don't know if you know this. I curate public art. And I actually presented a Japanese artist who did a um, phenomenal um, uh, ceramics work. We uh, placed it in um, Jackson Heights, Queens, because he wanted it to be amongst a lot of people that could appreciate. Do you remember his name? Oh, yes. And um, I, I will share that with you. It weighed 600 pounds. I will not forget that to my dying days. And it was a Buddhist rendition of um, a Sleeping Beauty with a Nirvana theme. And oh, I, love that. yeah, it real just the thought of that. When I, every time I say it, I, I remember that it was really quite beautiful. And then it was all about the reclining Buddha. And I took the time to learn about the reclining Buddha and what it meant culturally. And then what mm. was interesting, he and that's why I liked your artist. The head of the Sleeping Beauty was of a sheep. Huh. And uh, he had his uh, studio in Williamsburg, East Williamsburg. He had a kiln. And um, the Department of Transportation joined us so we could go to his studio as he was preparing the sculpture to go into the kiln. It was a very exciting moment to see how that, that must was have been all. a big kiln. Yeah, it was a big kiln, and we were very excited to see how he was placing it all into the kiln. And the way he uh, actually crafted the hair of the sheep, which had a human quality, it felt like it was braided. It wasn't like clay. It was that real. It was that unique. I'll make sure that you get to see images of it. It was quite stunning. And then it was oh, on a metal base. So therefore, it could be presented onto the street, and um, and you know, in a seamless sort of way, it was tied underneath to the base, so it could have you know be flushed on top. But yes, I do understand what you're trying to do with the ceramics. I think this is uh, magnificent. So I just want to say thank you so much, Jason, for joining thank us. Thank you this for afternoon. having me. This was a lovely, lovely conversation. And so we're going to get ready to end this segment and join our audience in a few seconds. Thank you. And so we're back and we're going to hear another uh, museum review from our contributor, Irene Javis, for our segment, Museum Edge. This is Irene Javers at the Museum Edge. To commemorate the anniversary of World War I, the Metropolitan Museum of Art at Fifth Avenue, New York City, has launched the exhibit World War I and the Visual Arts. The exhibit runs until January 7, 2018. This show focuses on the responses of artists and the arts to what is known as the Great War, World War I. The show unfolds year by year up to and through the years immediately after the armistice of November 11th, 1918, and beyond the Treaty of Versailles, signed on June 6th, 1919, officially ending the war. The show is drawn mostly from the Metropolitan Museum's own collection with loans from private collections. The exhibit focuses on how the war influenced subjects, techniques, and materials in the art making. The viewer is shown how difficult it was for the artists to find a visual language to express war experiences. We are shown the early propaganda efforts used to rally support for the war effort. This rapidly changes into depictions of the horrors of the trenches, chemical warfare, and the horrific deaths of soldiers and civilians. We are shown the war works 
of well-known artists such as Max Beckman, Pierre Bonnard, Edward Steichen, Marsden Hartley, John Singer Sargent, and many others. For this viewer, the rooms displaying the works of Otto Dix, 1891 to 1969, George Gross, 1893 to 1959, and Margaret Hall, 1876 to 1963, and the remarkable Catholic Colvitz, 1867 to 1945, just took my breath away. These artists courageously show the horror and destruction of war on societal and personal levels. World War I in the visual arts shows us that war is indeed hell and that the carnage and trauma it leaves behind runs deep and lodges in the hearts of all of us for generations long after. The exhibit is at the Met Fifth Avenue and runs until January 7, 2018. This is Irene Jabber's for State of the Arts, New York City, WBAI. And thank you, Irene, for another wonderful um museum review we are getting ready to wrap up our show just a few quick announcements for our audience one on september 30th uh, wbai is participating in a forum with the apollo theater in harlem Uh, that forum is based on a brand new production called we shall not be moved and we had both the composer and the libertist on our show, Daniel Romain and Mark Joseph. And they're going to just talk about some of the issues that are still um, being felt today about uh, communities and justice and how do you deal with differences. So that's a free event. So you can get your tickets at the Apollo Theater. That event will be on a Saturday afternoon, September 30th. So come out to the Apollo Theater in Harlem and get to meet some wonderful people. Hear great panelists, including our producer, Gary Bird, who will be the moderator for that event. So that will be on September 30th. And we just want to remind folks that on our Facebook and Twitter pages, we have uh, put down a lot of information so that you could go to the various fairs this weekend. There's several art book fairs. You got the Bushwick Open Studios that are coming up. You have musical events. Many of them are free. 23 museums are offering free admissions this weekend alone. So check on our sites. That's facebook.com slash S-O-T-A-R-T-S-N-Y-C. That's the acronym for State of the Arts NYC. You can go to our Twitter pages, same handle, twitter.com slash S-O-T-A-R-T-S-N-Y-C. You'll see a lot of information of places where you can go, many of them free. So with that said, we want to wish everyone a great week. It's the first day of autumn. I love autumn. And uh, we want you to get out there, enjoy your family, your friends, and we will see you next week for another rendition of our show. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I'm Jesse Lent with the WBAI Resistance Calendar. Two Saturdays in October, October 7th and October 22nd, the group Social Justice Tours will lead participants in what they're calling a Trump Midtown Walking Tour starting at 6 p.m. in Manhattan. To find out the exact location, go to socialjusticetours.com. Within the Midtown area, we are able to get a full spectrum of the Trump story and his rise to power, reads a description at socialjusticetours.com. What Trump has done is about a lot more than the single individual, and by looking at the agencies, actors, and government institutions that have supported his rise, we can come away with a larger societal understanding of justice in our country. 
Thursday, October 12th at 6 p.m. You can hear Douglas Husack, professor of philosophy and law at Rutgers University, and Barry Latzer, a professor of criminal justice at John Jay College, discuss the facts of the national prison population and new solutions for prosecuting and sentencing violent offenders at Fordham University Lincoln Center at 113 West 60th Street at Columbus Avenue in Manhattan. Nearly 2.3 million men and women are currently incarcerated in America's jails and prisons, 88% of which are in state prisons, reads a statement from organizers. According to recent data, approximately 53% of all state prisoners are in prison for violent offenses. Reducing prison populations in the future will require that we reconceptualize why and how we prosecute violence. To get more information, contact Fordham's Conferences and Events Department at events at tkc.edu or call 212-659-7200. Then on Friday, October 13th at 2 p.m., the Center for Humanities at the CUNY Graduate Center is holding a free workshop entitled Who's Funding All This and How Do We Stop Them? The workshop will be led by archivist, librarian, and activist Rochelle Brown in room 9205 at the Graduate Center at 365 Fifth Avenue on the corner of 34th Street in Manhattan. Because corporate interests in fossil fuel industries fund much of the cultural and social infrastructure, divestment is an increasingly important tactic for activists and organizers, reads an official statement from the Center for Humanities on the event. But how do we trace the flow of money and capital? At this workshop, Rochelle Brown will teach participants how to research and write about divestment campaigns, be they focused on fossil fuel struggles or the prison industrial complex. Come learn, analyze, network, and hone skills for building a better world. Find out more at centerforthehumanities.org slash programming slash calendar. The following day, Saturday, October 14th at 11 a.m., the Queen's Action Council and City Harvest are sponsoring Queen's Food Day at Socrates Sculpture Park at 3201 Vernon Boulevard in Astoria. Explore and become a part of the landscape of food justice in Northwest Queens, reads a statement from the council. This is a fun and interactive day packed with a variety of community organizations sharing knowledge and resources on nutrition education, food affordability and accessibility, urban farming, planting and gardening, sustainability, and healthy living. Join us for activities, conversations, cooking demos, and community building. Queen's Action Council will also moderate a special panel featuring community representatives in the realms of urban agriculture, transportation, and health. You can learn more about this event at facebook.com slash Queen's Action Council. That's the WBAI Resistance Calendar for the week ending Saturday, September 23rd. I'm Jesse Lent. This is Imhotep Gary Bird inviting you to a WBAI free-for-all Apollo Uptown Hall. Movement required. Saturday, September 30th at 4 p.m. Yeah, it's Radio GBE back live at the Apollo. I'll co-moderate a community conversation and panel with Philly broadcast activist Solomon Jones discussing police community relations and the role of artists as activists. We'll also revisit this year's anniversary of the historic deadly clash between the government and the citizens of MOVE through the eyes of 2017. Plus, we'll feature an excerpt of the acclaimed film Let the Fire Burn with director Jason Osdor and deal with the question what you gonna do if they come for you. Also joining us civil rights activist Tamika Mallory Mark Bamuthi Joseph of We Shall Not Be Moved, former NYPD detective Graham B. Witherspoon and WVAI's illustrious blacks Apollo Town Hall movement required Saturday September 30th at 4 p.m. live at the Apollo register in advance for your free tickets visit WBAI.org or ApolloTheater.org Hey, this is Reggie Johnson, the host of From the Soundboard, airing Wednesdays at 3 a.m. on this station. Here at WBAI, we love connecting with our listeners during fun drives. We are so grateful for your donations. They keep WBAI alive and vibrant. However, we prefer not to interrupt the cutting-edge programming that you depend on. So, we've decided to begin to shorten our fundraisers. That's why, from now until October 2nd, we're asking you to make a pre-fund drive donation. If the station can raise $50,000 in that time period, we'll shorten our fall fundraiser by two days. 
every little bit helps. So consider making a pledge today by clicking the link at WBAI.org. And thank you from all of us for your support. It's the WBAI Resistance Raffle. Hi, this is James Ursay. Join me Wednesday, October 4th from 6 to 9 p.m. when WBAI will be holding a gala raffle to raise funds for the radio station loved by numbers of people. Comedians, vocalists, jugglers, mimes will not be admitted. 